Okay, we are live, Mr. Chairman. Okay. We got just a couple of minutes or less than a minute. Okay, let's go ahead and call the meeting to order. Please take the roll call. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Baer. Here. Representative Burkhart. Here. Representative Duncan. Here. Representative Ayer. Here. Representative Gray. Here. Representative Heiner. Here. Representative Sherwood. Here. Representative Western. Here. Chairman Gray. Here. Okay, at this time, what I'd like to do is go ahead. I'm going to turn the chairmanship over to Vice Chair Duncan and let her run the show today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today we are hearing Cinephile 61, uh, and I am assuming, Mr. Chairman, you are going to walk us through the bill, or is someone else? Can you clarify that for me? Yeah, uh, Madam Chairman, Senator Rothless is available. He will walk us through the bill, and then I think he will also discuss the uh, proposed amendment uh, that was circulated yesterday. Okay, and I believe Senator Rothis. Good morning, Senator Rothis. Please go ahead morning, and Madam Chairman. Good morning, committee. Are you ready to roll? I'm sorry. I said go ahead and walk us through the bill, Senator. Oh, sorry about that. I was doing some connect, disconnect, reconnect thing, and I didn't quite hear you. Uh, so, Senate File 61 is. Obviously, the amortization of sales and use tax legislation that we uh, worked through in the off season, not all of the members have seen it. So I'll start by giving a little bit of an overview of the concept and then walk through uh, how the legislation is structured, uh, working with the engrossed version that came over. But for the benefit of the folks that uh, worked during the interim on it, I'll, I'll note the amendments that are that were made over in the Senate, uh, which were relatively minor. The concept of Senate File 61 with amortization of sales and use tax is the idea that on large projects where there's a substantial amount of equipment or uh, property purchased, the upfront cost of the sales tax and use tax have to be amortized through financing for the project cost, typically over the lifetime of whatever loan or financial service is used for that project. So when you're contemplating a large energy development project, for example, which may be several hundred million dollars or a billion dollars, then uh, in a circumstance where you were in a county with 6% sales tax, that cost of the equipment uh, amortized over the lifetime of the project and the finance costs associated with that can obviously be quite substantial. You would take the $6 million on the $100 million project cost, uh, you would roll that into your financing. That might be at 8% interest or whatever your finance rate is, your cost of capital, uh, Madam Chairman. And it then adds a substantial cost to the bottom line and affects the profitability. Uh, in conversations with industry in trying to explore what helps or hurts on projects, uh, the idea of providing alternative financing effectively for the sales and use tax so that the sales and use tax payments come out of cash flow rather than upfront costs uh, is an attractive concept. It's actually used in uh, some locations around the country. Uh, I'm uncertain whether any states have any programs like this, but we know that municipalities that are capable of restructuring or renegotiating their taxes uh, employ programs like this to offload the upfront costs over the lifetime of the project. So this legislation specifically focuses only on the state's share of sales and use taxes. That's important to realize. Not that it's a bad idea to focus on the other part. In fact, I think that's probably a good idea. This bill just doesn't do that, Madam Chairman. This bill focuses on the 2.8 cents 
of the four cents sales tax that goes to the state and provides an opportunity for a large project to effectively refinance that expense over some period of years amortized up to 10 years. Uh, and the intent is uh, providing a more attractive playground for economic development and for large projects where we save small amounts of money here and small amounts of money there for large projects that might be up to a billion dollars of, of cost, provide uh, good economic development for our communities, and then do that in a way that actually doesn't cut down on the revenues for the state, but simply changes the timeline of the revenues for the state. And as we walk through, hopefully it'll be clear how that's done. Uh, Madam Chairman, if at any point anybody does have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, but with that, I'll go into the bill as drafted. Uh, Madam Chairman, the bulk of the bill is effectively uh, one long paragraph beginning on page two, uh, which is looking at the collection procedure for sales and use tax compliance uh, by the Department of Revenue for a project and then looking at line six where over a two-year period of time the construction operation of the project in Wyoming if that project has costs in excess of five million dollars and just to be clear, there's nothing magical about $5 million. It's an attempt at a Goldilocks number that balances the amount of administrative overhead with the benefit to the state. If you have any suggestions on a better number and a reason why, by all means, bring it. But for a project over $5 million, I see Chairman Greer's hand. Can I caution you for, or pause you for a moment? Uh, Chairman Greer has a question. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, or Madam Chairman. You, you know, so so I was one that wanted a higher number, and and so when you look at 2.8 cents on a five million dollar project, it's 140 thousand dollars worth of state sales tax. Is that really worth the effort? And and so that was one of my concerns. And and uh, during the interim, uh, we had this somewhere around it was 10 million. It got amended numerous times, committee, and so. I, uh, while I don't want to muddy the waters, I probably will amend this to raise the, the, the number up for discussion. Right. Representative Ayer. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I think another thing to keep in mind here, this is only expenditures that are subject to sales tax. So labor would not be included in that. So it's not the total cost of the project, it's just that amount that's subject to sales tax. Representative Burkhart. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, question, Senator Rothfuss, the way I read this, I read it as the project in excess of $5 million. Was that the intent or is the intent that the owed sales tax was in $5 million? Senator Rothfuss. Mr. Madam Chairman and uh, Representative Burkhart, it is structured that the, and, and it's um, beginning on five, line five, to have expenditures subject to Wyoming sales and use tax, that gets a representative heirs concept. There's going to be plenty of other expenditures, but we're just talking about those expenditures subject to sales and use tax over the first two years of construction operation of the project in excess of $5 million. So it is the cost of those goods that are subject to sales and use tax of five million, not $5 million worth of taxes, which gets back at Chairman Greer's point of, is that high enough if it's only bringing $140,000 in? And honestly, as we start this up, I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable raising that number. It, it, it's probably making more and more sense the more we hear about it and the more we talk about it, uh, particularly during kind of a trial break-in period before we're good at it, if, if we, uh, if we really want to be focused on hundred million dollar projects, uh, as we as we figure out how this works, that seems rational. Representative Bear, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, 
I have a question. I think I know the answer to it, but when a mine in my county were to buy a $28 million shovel, I assume that this particular bill would apply to that particular purchase since that would be a sales taxable item. Is that correct? Senator Madam Robert? Chairman, Representative, that absolutely. I mean, you, you'd pretty much just call that a quick project. Yep, new shovel project, $28 million amortized over five years or whatever the case is, and we'll get to that. Absolutely. Any further questions? Okay, Senator Rothfuss, please continue. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So as you can see then beginning on lines eight, and I, I want to take note here that for those that have looked at this before, this is the first place eight and on to line, line nine, where we have a little bit of new language here. So those that have worked before, uh, please note the addition of this language that says the taxpayer may apply to the department to amortize the sales taxes imposed under Wyoming statute. And then the use taxes imposed under Wyoming statute. The point there was to make it more explicit that we're talking about that 2.8 ish cents, the, the state's portion of the sales and use tax to remove any ambiguity. And there was uncertainty before. So we wanted to make sure that, that, that clarity was explicit. And that was the first point of amendment from the Senate side. I don't see any questions on that, Madam Chairman. So, up oh, there is oh. Representative Bear. Representative Bear. Thank you. Um, as reading, I was reading the notes and the uh, LSO was not able to determine the cost of programming to be able to separate this from the remaining of uh, four cents of the tax. And have we gotten any information since that uh, note was created as to what that expenditure would be uh, in order to administer this program? Senator Rothfuss. Madam Chairman, Representative Baird, it's my understanding that the Department of Revenue has looked into that, but I haven't heard the answer yet. So I'm, I'm about to find out when you do theoretically during public testimony today, what they anticipate the cost is going to be. They were looking into that uh, following the Minerals Committee um, meeting that we had on the Senate side. Okay, go ahead and continue, Senator Rothfuss. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And then a key provision then on to line 14 of the engrossed version is, or 13 and 14, is that the amortization would occur over the expected life of the project not to exceed a period of 10 years. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, lines 14 through 19, uh, look at the fact that the amortization shall, or the, excuse me, the department shall establish amortization schedules, fees, terms, and conditions for each project that is approved for amortization. So that provides them with broad flexibility to negotiate on a project by project basis. But at the same time, there was desire by a member of the House Minerals Committee who's transferred uh, away from the committee, but it was a good concept that lines 14 through, excuse me, it's, uh, 16 through 19 indicates, oh, this is new language, sorry, and, and I'll, I'll get back to the other point. 16 through 19 is again, new language that we added over in the Senate, uh, addressing a concern where the interest rates for approved projects under this paragraph shall be established by the department to account for inflation during the term of amortization. So we had discussion of that during the interim of what these rates would be set at. And the department came back and said that without explicit language saying that our intent was to be covering just inflation, uh, then they felt like they would be compelled to adhere to uh, uh, some prudent financing and investment standards and, and basically be looking at what the state would get on a return on investment for dollars in the permanent Wyoming Mineral Trust Fund or elsewhere. So they saw it as a requirement that for fiscal responsibility, they would have to be looking at a much higher interest rate than what this is intending, where this is intending to just offset inflation so that we're getting the true cost back to the state, but we're not making money off of the financing, so to speak. So that, that's the intent of this specific sentence being added over on the Senate side is to provide sufficient directive to the department that they would 
compensate for inflation costs as opposed to trying to make money off of the financing. All right, now it's the next sentence that uh, requires that the department shall establish and publish not less than once annually fixed terms, fees, and rates that are available. The idea here is, is just being able to go to a website if you're some business contemplating a development project in Wyoming. So you get an idea of what is available and you could have that. So getting back to the shovel example, Representative Bear, uh, Madam Chairman, if, if we had an opportunity where there's just a good deal, five years amortized that 2% uh, interest rate and, and I'd have to pay this schedule, that would be readily published. It's not a very complicated project. I would just take that rate potentially that's published on the Department of Revenue's website and I would know that I would be able to get that rate for a year. But again, if desired, you could go back and renegotiate the terms and conditions to make them more appropriate for the specific project. Madam Chairman, moving on to the line 23 at the bottom of page two and on to the following page uh, is discussion of priority lien arrangement. And the, the background here, as all of you know, is that we struggled with lien priority with regard to severance taxes. And we've been passing legislation over the past few years to compensate for that and try and catch up where we can have all of our taxes paid in the event of a bankruptcy. So this starts off with incorporating the fact that there will be a lien upon the property itself that was purchased for the entire amount of sales and use taxes that are amortized. So you can imagine once again that you've basically got a, a super priority lien on 2.8% of the original value of the property for five years, which provides pretty darn good surety in the event of a bankruptcy that you'll get back your 2.8%. Uh, that's, that's about as good of a certainty as you can have. Uh, and then you see specifically the super priority language is in the next uh, sentence on lines two through five, two through four, excuse me. Uh, lines, the, the next sentence indicates that the department may use any of its typical taxpayer enforcement provisions under this article. And I'll note before we go past the lien language, the topic that we have for a proposed amendment is the idea that for some industry and corporations, based on the way they finance their projects, there was a request that flexibility be given where it might not be a lien as the security interest. It might be an alternative security interest that provides the same certainty as a first priority lien through the bankruptcy through liquidation. So you'll see in the proposed language that we may consider later, Madam Chairman, that it provides that alternative. And, and just to clarify, that's something that, that it's based on language that we use uh, with regard to some of the statutes for the Department of Environmental Quality, where they wanna make sure that their bonds outlast bankruptcies. So the language is modeled after that. Representative Baer has a question. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Um, this is a question for the Senator. I, not being a banker uh, and understanding all as aspects of financing, is this superiority uh, in our lien, is it gonna create problems for some uh, financing where banks would uh, maybe want to have that prim primacy? Uh, and I just, I just can see that potentially being an issue which would derail this opportunity to attract new business to the state. Senator Raffas. Madam Chairman, thank you. Representative Baer. Yes, uh, it is a problem. Every bank always wants uh, super priority, first priority liens on everything they do. Uh, it would raise the cost of capital if you're, if you're not first priority lien. They, they just take that into consideration in the risk analysis and they give you a different interest rate. Uh, I think it is important to realize that you're only talking about 2.8% or 2 of the project cost has that super priority lien, the rest, you would have uh, a secondary priority lien. So you can imagine you're still in a pretty good position of, of security. But uh, Representative, the, the point you're making is exactly why we have the amendment, which will provide flexibility. If this super priority lien circumstance works for you, works for your financiers, and, and is a, a good plan, that's the plan you would take. 
Uh, and if it's not, if, if your financier struggles with the idea that the first 2.8% would be secured by the state of Wyoming, and they may, I, I'm not a banker either, I'm an engineer. Uh, if, if, they, if they do, then you would have the opportunity to look to alternative securities and surety that, that, would, that you'd have to pay for. Um, but th those are out there. Chairman Greer? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chairman. If I may just uh, on that, it's a very good question, Representative Bear. But uh, the fact is, is you're looking at, um, and so I, I'm not a banker, but I represented several banks in, in my other life. And uh, the fact is, is if, if you come in, you're giving a loan, and if it's a $50 million loan and you're able to carve off uh, a big chunk of that, okay? And so the loan, instead of being paid out up front, you, you just know that you're subordinate to that $240,000 or whatever that amount comes up to be. I guess it's, it's more than that. It's going to end up being $1.4 um, million. But if, you, um, if you're subordinate to that, this is your option. You're subordinate to a tax that would be due that you may have to loan on otherwise and then pay it up front. So most banks are going to understand that and be comfortable. With respect to loans on real estate, for example, every mortgage, every loan that's given uh, that's secured by a mortgage on real estate is subordinate to the taxes. And they know that going in. So it's not, I don't see it as a huge hindrance. Uh, the issue of doing this surety uh, with respect to the amendment we're going to see is just another option that looks um, more attractive on certain balance sheets um, and why that discussion is happening. So my comments, thank you. Representative Heiner. Thank you, Chair, Chairperson. Uh, just a, a bit of a clarification here. The, state, the state's gonna charge an interest rate on this uh, tax money that's, that's going to be amortized. Uh, so the, uh, or if they want to roll it into their construction loan, they would get charged an interest rate for that. So really the difference is the difference in interest rates being charged. So they, they pay the construction loan interest rate or whatever the state comes up with an interest. And uh, you know, for a hundred million dollar loan, let's say the difference is only 2%, we're talking $50,000 a year. So it, it really boils down to small money, uh, whether they finance it or whether they, with, the, with their construction loan or finance it with uh, the state. Is, is that wrong in my thought pattern there? Senator Rothis. Madam Chairman, Representative Heiner, it depends on the cost of capital of those that are doing the project. Uh, you've got some very large companies that would be doing projects in Wyoming that have a cost of capital at three, three and a half percent. They have incredible ratings. Uh, I don't know that they would do this. Maybe they would because we'd probably still only charge them 2%. And uh, they, they like their bottom line and they, they hire people that optimize it. So maybe they would, but maybe it wouldn't be worth it to them. If your cost of capital is 8% and you have an opportunity over the lifetime of a project to amortize some portion of that. And again, it's 2.8% now. I mentioned this earlier. Uh, this will be a lot better program when we get it to the point where you've got an optional 6% available. But that requires a lot more work and it requires us working with the counties and the cities and developing a program where the rest of the taxes can be used through a program like this. So th this is not the end of the game. This is a part of the games. But if you think of the objective here of amortizing 6% of the cost of a very large project, putting it into cash flow instead of upfront, and then having, for example, a finance rate of 2% versus 8%, you're, you're affecting the profitability of a project. And again, it's one piece of the profitability of a project. This alone probably doesn't make a decision, but this is how they make the decision, right? They pencil out the project and they look at what their profitability is going to be and they select based on that profitability. So all the tools we put in the toolbox, as long as they don't hurt the state of Wyoming, if, if they're leading to positive cash flow, if they're leading to positive profitability, those are the kinds of things that make it attractive, particularly if it doesn't cost the state anything, and this is one that is intended not to. And the last thing I'd say on that, Representative Heiner, is I have had discussion with developers on this type of program, and they like it. They, they indicate that this is exactly the kind of thing that helps them to select because of how it looks on their balance sheets. 
Chairman Greer. Yeah, um, Madam, Madam Chairman, I um, I also just want to kind of piggyback on that just a little bit. Is is, is hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars on a, a twenty-five million, fifty million dollar project changes the internal rate of return when companies are analyzing a particular project. And so, if you flow that into cash flow rather than an upfront cost spread out over the life of the project. It changes it, and it changes it by up half a percent, three quarters of a percent. And I, I just got done with a, a group that I'm uh, on the board of um, with a, with a project in it. And it really, believe it or not, from two different locations. One of them dealt with uh, a tax rebate benefit uh, that was given to us um, by a community in, in Illinois. And and it's absolutely amazing when you run those numbers out. Uh, and that internal, that internal rate of return changes. And so that's what we're talking about. So it's more than just the savings uh, on the, uh, the interest rate. It's that upfront capital is a good center set. Representative Western. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I was actually, uh, the good chairman actually kind of stole my thunder as well as did uh, the vice chair of Senate Minerals earlier. Uh, I think that's exactly it. If, if, if we can, offer a program like this that really improves the debt service coverage ratio of some of these companies, because almost all of them take out debt, right? Whether it's in capital markets or whether it's a commercial lender or whatever it is, if they can go back to the books and, and pencil it out and they can improve the, their debt service coverage ratio by, you know, even five basis points, uh, let alone, you know, 50, uh, then that, that can really have a, a, a big impact on kind of the calculus that some of these companies run, whether it's a shovel in one of the mines or a big drilling rig out in the Powder River Basin or whatever it is, those ones that would incur, you know, a, a sales tax burden of, you know, half million, million dollars plus, I th absolutely think that that even if they can improve their, you know, some of these metrics, whether again, whether it be IR and RR or the debt service coverage ratio, absolutely, that's going to factor their decision. If this is something that could be due to be more business friendly at minimal risk to the state, I, I think it's, it, it's a layup for everybody. It's a win-win-win for all the, all the stakeholders. Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, Senator Raffis, would you continue, please? Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm just about through with it. Uh, the next paragraph just indicates that the department will adopt rules and regulations to manage this project. And there's a lot to think through, uh, but uh, there's a reason why there's not specificity on some of the concepts of exactly who pays what, when, where, and how, uh, because I, I do think there are nuances there that, that have to be uh, carefully thought through and, and are better outside of statute than in statute. Uh, the next sentence just discusses the fact that vendors uh, will not be liable for returns. It's basically who the, the um, entity that negotiates the, the tax amortization has the responsibility. Second tier vendors will not be inheriting responsibility. Uh, there's a definition of project beginning on line 15, which is created to be very broad. And uh, as you read that, there's a reason why it's not very specific. It basically is if it's adding value to the state of Wyoming uh, and it's, it, it falls under something that you could amortize sales and use property, we're good. That's a project. So getting back to uh, Representative Bear's question, um, Madam Chairman, that, yeah, shovel, perfect. <laughs> it's a project. <laughs> Uh, and then the rest of the legislation, Madam Chairman, is, is simply the conforming language that's necessary to ensure uh, appropriate payout and sales and use um, mirroring and statute. So with, with that, Madam Chairman, I'd be happy to take any further questions. I know there is some public comment, and then we've got the amendment to contemplate as well. Okay. Any further questions for Senator Rothis before we go to uh, the department? No? Okay, uh, Jonathan, can you, I guess I can allow them in or you need to let them in? I guess you did, thank you. Uh, Chairman Duncan, I have a question. Yes, Representative Gray. Thank you, uh, Senator Roth, that's not trying to belabor this, but you know, surprised by the vote in the Senate and, and the composition of the vote actually. And so curious about the legislative history, what the discussion was and, and what 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 happened over there thank you thank you madam chairman and to address uh representative gray's 
concern. I, I, I think there were a few things. One was that there, this might be challenging to do. Uh, and again, it, it, it still was a strong vote, but it would have been nice to have it, uh, have it stronger. Uh, a second concern was, and this is one that I, I, I just, I just don't agree with. Well, this might not get used. That's true. I mean, I and it's basically what I said on the floor. Yeah, I I don't know that this will get used. I hope it will. And and what I pointed out, Representative Gray was, uh, one five hundred million dollar project selects Wyoming because of this. We won. Uh, that's a that's a total victory. Uh, and it's not just the small amount of of interest and tax. There's going to be a lot more that goes into that project. And then. Madam Chairman, Representative Gray, the, the final concept I think that comes through is just the idea that uh, a lot of folks don't like to support economic development legislation. And uh, I think a lot of the uh, folks that were opposed to it are, are just generally opposed to us getting involved with, with economic development. And um, the final point that I would say was raised is and again, I, I don't know how you can conclude it, but the idea that that there's the possibility of bankruptcy default, and I just don't know how to I don't know how to get there mathematically on 2.8 percent of the value of real property that's still on the ground. Uh, if you've got the superior lien, I think you're gonna I think you're gonna get your taxes. So. I hope that characterizes that I might've missed something, Representative. Madam Chairman, thank you. Representative Burkhart. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, just to add to what the good Senator said, I think this will be used. Uh, they're currently on the, on the planning stage, uh, several multi-billion dollar projects, and they are interested in, the, in this bill as it will save them a considerable amount of money uh, for economic development within the state. So. Um, just wanted to add that. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Representative Heiner. Thank you, Madam Chairman. The other thing that we need to consider here is the time value of money. Uh, the, the state, uh, do we want to have, our, have that money now or do we want to, in essence, buy an annuity and get it over the next 10 years? What value is that to, to, the, to the state of Wyoming? And right now we, uh, we could use that money as soon as possible. I'm, I'm sure we all realize that. So do we wanna take that risk and go out and buy an annuity? Or do we want to have that come into the state when we most direly need that, which is right now, as soon as possible. So that's, that's the, the extent of my comment. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Okay, any further questions or comments before we go to Mr. Noble? Representative Western. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I appreciate the, uh, the good representative from Sweetwater County's point that, you know, do you want the money now or do you want it later? From a sales tax perspective, these big time projects are not what is gonna be driving the overall sales tax figures, right? I think that, you know, we all know that it's tourism and some of that other kind of stuff is what really drives the majority of the sales tax. Whereas a measure like this, compared to what we get from sales tax from these smaller purchases, you know, it's, it's a relatively negligible number. So I, I certainly appreciate that point, but I think we can't lose context of what that number would be versus what sales tax generates across the board and across the state. So thank you. Andy, for, oh, Representative Heiner. Follow up there. Uh, I, I appreciate the good representative's comments, but in this past year the, during the pandemic, the sales tax from uh, uh, the, the county just to the, to the east of here due to a large project to deal with wind actually was a big bump to, to help the state. So those sales taxes on a huge project, which is what we're talking about here are large projects. Those sales tax coming into the state are very vital for the big projects because they do make a, make a material difference in our fiscal uh, stability. Madam Chairman, may I, may I suggest that we save our internal debate until we decide to work the bill and this finish taking testimony? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just about to say so. Uh, can we go to uh, Mr. Noble, please? Morning, Madam Chairman. Uh, members of the committee, I'm Dan Noble, Director of the Department of Revenue. 
Um, I'll limit my comments to the administration of the bill um, and some of the concerns we have with the administration. Um, start off with um, what is referred to in, in, uh, in the bill itself. It basically says that the taxpayer may apply for uh, this loan. Well, taxpayer is a defined term in statute and um, it, it, in, in the uh, contract law, the person that is the taxpayer associated with, with taxes that are due is the contractor. And in some of the projects we're talking about here, you may have 50, 60 contractors associated with a project. Um, you know, you look at the wind farms and, and the, the number of contractors that are set up to, to work on various aspects of a, of a contractor. The person that is the taxpayer in each of those is the person that is performing the work and incorporating the materials that they utilize into, the, into their contract. I think what we need to look at is possibly identifying the project owner as opposed to the taxpayer. Ultimately, in, at the end of the day, the, the contract owner ultimately is responsible for the payment of all of everything that is incorporated into, them, into that contract and is, is the person that pays the sales tax, if you will. But the law, as it's written currently, states that the contractor is the person who is liable for that, uh, for that tax on, on the materials that they incorporate into that real property contract. This probably works fairly well when you're talking about something like the, the uh, uh, drag line or, or shovel that you're talking about, which is a piece of equipment, um, and, and you're not worried about the, the labor that goes into it, uh, you're going to end up paying the, the uh, tax on those materials. Uh, the, uh, for, for that piece of equipment. But in, in the instance of a real property contract, and I hearken back to the wind farms, uh, the, the, the EISs that I've seen have, you know, several uh, contractors involved in, the, in that process. We need to identify who's going to be the person that, that the department is going to hold liable for this tax. Uh, and, and really, I think that kind of needs to be, be identified more specifically. The other aspect of this that is problematic, and, and no matter how you approach this, it's kind of got a, it's a, um, some issues in administration. The way the sales tax is currently um, collected is it's reported by the taxpayer on a, ta on a tax form. Our system calculates it for its accuracy, and then it develops a distribution to the, you know, based on the way the statutes are written, either into the general fund or to the local government um, where the, uh, the taxes go. That separation has to be somehow identified, number one, for a specific project. And that's not currently the way it's done. Each of those contractors that, that, uh, um, that, that report on this project are gonna have their own tax return that they report on this. So I've got to somehow develop a, a carve out, if you will, for all of those taxpayers that, that report this tax, put it under one umbrella, create a distribution to local government so that they get their taxes, and then create a, uh, a uh, payment plan, if you will, from that specific, I guess I'll say project owner for, for lack of a better term, um, for the taxes that are being foregone for the uh, state piece of it. And the thing is, those taxes have already been paid. So it's almost as if it would be better to do, utilize this as a credit back to the project owner and then pay those taxes out from that. Because the only way that you're going to, to fix it for these large projects is for one person to pay that tax and then for that, uh, that person to request uh, you know, this, this, this process. And it's just not currently set up that way in, in the, the way this bill is drafted. Can it be done? Certainly. Um, my concern is I don't want to, to float an administrative cost on, on uh, retooling our system to make that happen and, and recognize that that price tag might make this un, unattractive in the first place. Um, as it stands right now, we asked for this when there was a separation. I think there's another iteration of this where a fiscal note was requested. And the, tax, the, the price tag for getting that in place was $979,000 and about an eight month project to get that system 
altered to make that happen. That doesn't even address the issue of who's the taxpayer in this. And I think it's important to, to recognize that. Uh, I, I think, I, I certainly understand, you know, the, the benefit to this. I've been in, in, I don't know how many meetings associated with the wind farms where they've discussed their cost of capital with the sales tax alone and the, the uh, attractiveness to them uh, they even point to the fact that an income tax is preferable to a sales tax because of the fact that you don't pay it all up front. It, it is paid out over the, the income stream of the project. And I certainly understand uh, the, the desire to offer an economic incentive. It's just that we've got to kind of work out some kinks in this because the administration of it right now um, needs some help. Okay. And with Chairman. Alice, have any questions? Mm -hmm. You're still on mute, Chairman Greer. Okay. Yeah, Director Noble, great, great comments. I appreciate it. I, you know, the, the concept of the credit back is, is attractive because you can administer it very well, right? The, the onus is on the owner to, to bring all this together and say, this is, this is what was spent. But I think the problem with that then is that the money's then spent. So it doesn't help with that upfront financing or capital or, um, and, and that I think is a, is a large component of driving it is as Representative Heiner said, this differential in interest rates really isn't that big. The differential between a company's internal uh, capital is probably larger because those usually run around 7%. But the, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I understand your difficulty, but if we were to do some sort of credit system, I, I think it would, we would lose that half of the equation. So uh, just you're shaking your head yes, I agree with that. <laughs> Mr. Noble. Um, Madam Chairman, Chairman Greer, I, I, I understand the, uh, the, the need to have this aggregated, if you will, uh, the project itself to be aggregated and, and to, to, uh, to credit that tax back. But the problem is when you're, when you're talking about a contract that's being done, that, that tax, is the responsibility of the contractor and not necessarily the project owner. It ultimately gets it rolled into, if you will, uh, the, the cost of the project itself. I mean, when, when, I, when I have a home built, obviously it's, let's just say it's a, a $200,000 for the home, uh, there's sales tax in that, obviously. Now it, it's paid for by the framing contractor, it's paid for by the, the plumbers and the electricians and the people that incorporate all those materials into that house but they're the ones that actually pay the tax on it. They send me a bill and it doesn't even have tax on it because quite frankly, they're the ones that, that, uh, that paid it. That's where I see this being problematic because we've got to somehow, and, and I'm not saying it can't be done. We've got to figure out a way to find where that tax is at. And before it gets paid and spent and, and distributed out to all of the entities, we've got to aggregate that all together and it's got to be put into a, uh, this is the amount that, that would have been subject to this tax. And we pay that whole amount up to, you know, to back to her. It's paid back to us over time, but we've got to treat it as if it was a loan before the tax ever gets paid. If that makes any sense. I, um, Follow up Chairman Greer. I do. So uh, thank you, Madam Chairman and, and then Director Noble. So I, so I think in terms of uh, utilization of the um, manufacturing exemption, which I have familiar, familiarity with that, you know, it's, uh, it, and so I guess I asked this question, is within rule, could you find a mechanism wherein these taxpayers could be identified by that owner? And um, because we typically pre-approve with our vendors on our large uh, purchases of manufacturing equipment, we kind of go through that exercise to make sure it's lined up. Is, is that something that could be accomplished through rule? Mr. Noble. Um, um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Madam Chairman, Mr. Mr. Chairman, um, I guess the thing that I'm, I'm wondering that might, obviously you want this to remain taxable. You don't want to create an exemption for it. What you want to do is you want to say, okay, um, of that, of that tax, we don't want it reported immediately by the by the contractors that are that are incorporating this. We want it reported to the contract owner, 
and the contract owner comes to us with this amount of tax and says, this is the amount of tax that has been foregone by the contractors. Um, we need to establish a 10 year payment arrangement associated with that. Otherwise the tax is due. And I'm not sure I can accomplish that in rules. It, it almost requires a, uh, a statutory um, forbearance of this or the, um, and no, I shouldn't say that. Maybe maybe we can accomplish it in rules, because what really what you're after is the 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 company that comes to us and says we're going to we're going to put in a five hundred million dollar con uh, uh, a wind farm, if you will, or a, a billion dollar wind farm, and we want to forego the taxes associated with that. We somehow have to credit the tax that would be paid by each contractor, probably submitted to us separately. And then we send uh, a tax bill, if you will, to the, the contract owner and say, you've got 10 years to pay this. It, it becomes a, a loan, if you will, at that point in time to the contract owner. But we've got to somehow say, you as the subcontractors need to report to us this tax, not pay it, but report to us this tax. We aggregate it and, and put it on as a lien uh, against the, the contract owner. I'm not so sure about that can, whether that can be accomplished by a rule, but I think it certainly speaks to the intent of what we're trying to do here. Representative Heiner, do you have anything new to ask? Yes, thank, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I appreciate the, the testimony of Director Noble and uh, his, his ex explanation of the uh, complicated procedures he would have to go through for this tax. And I, and I also appreciate his can-do attitude no matter what uh, he, he says he could figure this out and it may be difficult. Uh, I, can, I can envision a contractor, a number of contractors building a grassroots facility out there and they're trying to keep track of all the widgets that they, they buy as it to, to build this and they go tax exempt at the store when they're buying it, but then they have to keep track of that such that they can, they can uh, pay or, or put that in the spreadsheet so that we know how much tax is owed. So I, I see that as a, uh, a monumental task, but I appreciate the good director's uh, desire to, to accomplish this. Uh, he did mention that uh, it would take some money up front to, uh, to get the, to retool his office, as well as a little bit of time. But the question I have is, will there be additional administrative costs, such as a FTE, to, to administer the contracts and all of this uh, paperwork and documentation for, for this project? or the number of projects going forward. Director Noble. Um, Madam Chairman, Representative Heiner, I, you know, um, we can actually avoid probably most of the administration of this if, if all the tax is included and it, and it probably is, it is more workable if the entire sales tax associated with this, meaning local options, everything is incorporated into this because then I'm not telling um, vendors or contractors to own to, to pay me the local option, but but uh, report to me what the rest of the tax is. I think that creates some some uh, complexities that that probably don't have to be there. Now I do recognize on the other end of it, there will be complexities as it relates to specific purpose option taxes and things like that because the local government will be getting paid out on a specific purpose option tax over ten years when that tax may only be in place for two. So that creates some complexity, but as far as administration goes, um, I'm pretty much just basically telling the contractor, you're exempt from this, you got to report it to me. I'm going to make the contract owner or the, the project owner, the person liable for this tax. That, that way, all of the tax is rolled into a payment arrangement it talks to, to what uh, Senator Rothfuss was, was describing when he said that, you know, ultimately we'd like to have all this tax included in it because it makes it much more attractive to the, uh, to the contract owners. But I mean, when you, when you do it that way, I don't have to ask my system to split these taxes out on, and, and deal with them separately. It becomes a, a uh, um, it, I guess I'd call it a, an amortization of all of the tax and then the only thing that we really have to understand is that 
when you have a specific purpose option tax, there may be a fairly uh, good stream of income coming in after the end of that project. And as long as that, you know, define the rules as to what it can be spent on, that probably doesn't make that big of an, of an eel. And it might even be good if you've got a, a project that needs maintenance after that anyway. So that's kind of my thought on it. If you look at splitting this out, then you're asking the contractors to say, okay, I'm going to pay this amount on the local options. I'm going to pay this. I'm not I'm going to avoid paying this because you're going to bill the contract owner for it. Those are system changes. And we're probably looking at, at close to a million dollars to get it up and running. Um, now, granted, that is a guess. <laughs> um, we don't really know. Uh, until we dig into it, what, what all the moving parts are on this, but I, I wanted you to be aware of that. Thank you, Director Noble. Um, committee, I just want you guys to be aware of the time. We only have about seven minutes to be able to work this bill. Um, seven, eight minutes tops to get back into session. Um, so can we let the other two um, people in now? Chairman Greer? You know, Madam uh, Chairman, while they're being let in, I let the speaker know we may be, we may run a little late. Just get the public uh, testimony on this uh, because we will be coming back in March. Um, maybe it may be appropriate for us to lay this back and then send to Rockless. Maybe this look at um, addressing some of Director Noble's concerns and uh, give this the old, the old college try, but this, um, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I thought we would get this bill done in an hour. So I, that's on me for scheduling more time. I apologize. Thank you, Chairman Greer. Uh, let's start with Marianne. Is it Shaner? Shanner? Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, Marianne Shaner on behalf of NextEra Energy Resources. We very much appreciate the work of the committee on this bill, uh, and it is something that we do support. Um, we think that it would be a good economic development tool for the state moving forward. Uh, we have been uh, one part of the bill that we did have concern with related to the uh, paramount lien and the amendment that Senator Rothfuss has discussed would address our concerns. We feel and we completely understand uh, the situation of the state and the importance of the state to be able to recover any of the taxes in the event that a taxpayer would become insolvent or go into bankruptcy. And we feel that the amendment that would provide an ability to provide some other type of financial security that would be on equal footing of the lien uh, would be a tool that we could use um, because of the fact that renewable development is, is unique in its financing as well as specific to next era. So we, again, appreciate the work of the committee. Uh, we would support the amendment that has been drafted by Senator Rothfuss. I'd stand for any questions. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you so much. Thank you. Terry Lucero. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I have nothing further from the department standpoint to uh, add that Director Noble didn't already touch on. Okay, great, thank you so much. Okay, committee, anything further? So, Chairman Madam, uh, Madam Chairman, I guess committee, um, and I, if, if, if I may indulge, sorry, I, uh, is uh, is the committee interested in in maybe pulling this back, discussing this, and uh, try to maybe rework it to address a couple of the uh, of the uh, concerns? I that's what I'm leaning towards. I, um, you know, or we can kick this on out to the House floor, uh, but we got to move quick here. Representative Burkhart. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I would uh, move that we lay this back to our first meeting in uh, when session reconvenes. Okay, that's been moved and seconded by Representative Bear. All those in favor, raise your hand. Representative Gray has a question. Representative Gray. Yeah, Ma Madam Chairman, you know, I was wondering if you know, this discussion on Friday is very important, but if we could either come in at 7.30 or maybe, do you think it's gonna take the whole two hours and you know, maybe we could work this the first half hour and 
get it get it moving. Um, I'm just concerned that we're that we got too much stacking up. But anyway, Chairman Greer, would you like to respond to that? Uh, legitimate, legitimate concern. I mean, I, I don't know how we're going to do the work that we've got at the pace we're at. Uh, my understanding um, is is that we're going to uh, we'll we will have a minerals standing house minerals meeting um, during this break. And I think that's what we'll do is we can bring that in. Uh, let Senator Rothless uh, kind of go back a little bit to the drawing board on this, see if um, can address some of these concerns. Uh, because I do see the, the significance of the difference between taxpayer and owner, which I think can be resolved uh, with, with a definition uh, on how the agreement comes together. And then that'll help with the administration. And I don't want to rush doing that um, and I, right now I don't want to spend three hours trying to do it on the house floor. Uh, so I think we could come back right not next week, but the following week have a, uh, another standing committee meeting. Um, and I apologize. I should have went ahead and scheduled this meeting for eight. Um, I just, I had another meeting, uh, at eight. <laughs> so, um, okay. Representative Sherwood. Thank you, Chairwoman Duncan. I'm wondering though if we have time to adopt the amendment. Um, I, I'm Representative Burkhardt. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chairman. To adopt the amendment, I believe we would have to move the bill first. And if we move the bill, then we have to debate the bill and work through it. And the way we're going, uh, that's probably another hour to hour and a half. Thank you, Representative Burkhart, and not to mention it, it needs some work to, to change some of those definitions that we were just discussing, so from my understanding. So I'm sensing, are you ready to vote on moving, laying on Representative uh, Burkhart's motion to lay it back? Yes? Question. Okay, all those in favor of laying uh, Representative Burkhart's motion, please raise your hand to the camera. Those opposed? Motions passed. I believe that's all we have, Chairman Greer. Yeah, Madam Chairman, if we, yeah, you can go ahead and adjourn the meeting, but I'd like the committee to stay on for a brief moment. Uh, Senator Rothless, you could stay too. I just want a, a couple words about our meeting on Friday. Okay, thank you everyone that participated. And Jonathan, can you please um, take us, adjourn our meeting and take us off of